It should always be fun. Everyone says it should always be a lot of work. It should always be fun. And if it's not fun, it's not going to be sustainable. And if it's not sustainable, then your business doesn't have a great prognosis for sustainable health. Microphone check, one, two, what is this? You're now listening to a brand new episode of the Play Big Faster podcast. Look what you done started. Talk to him. Attorney, high-performance coach, and speaker Cherie Prince asks hard questions to really get to the bottom of what makes entrepreneurs tick. From starting a business, marketing, strategies, and the ins and outs of their industries. We talk everything from book recommendations, lifestyle hacks, and everything possible to get you inspired and motivated to build your own business. The Play Big Faster podcast starts now. Let's go. Welcome to another episode of the Play Big Faster podcast. We are joined today by Samuel Drawshag, the co-founder and chief process scientist at Truble, also the co-host of the Business Therapy podcast. Samuel, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. There is something very interesting that you do as it relates to helping businesses work better. Tell us a little bit about it. Absolutely. So I'm a process scientist, which is a fairly new field. And process science is, I'd like to tell you, it's the evolution of process improvement. So when we talk about how we apply process science to businesses, I do some consulting, coaching, and right now we're building at Truval software products to help people be their own process consultants. And a lot of consulting in this space is helping businesses with automation, scaling, and growth strategies. So that's really the primary application of process science, which is a hot topic now with all the automation and scaling that businesses are trying to do. And so when we look at automation, I know that automation itself, it's separate than AI, but how has AI affected what you do? Yeah, absolutely. And that, and I love the question, even that you started with automation is separate from AI, because I think there's the sense that it's all one big thing now, robotics, AI, automation. But how we help with AI, AI is a tool. It's an advanced tool, just like any other tool in the market. So you now have all these digital tools, even your typical SaaS products and all these digital tools you can get. AI is just an advanced version. And I always tell people you can't put any tool in your business unless you have a way to automate your processes. Because you can automate with people, you can automate with robots, you can automate with artificial intelligence. But whatever you do, you have to go through the business process of studying and automating the process from a logic perspective before you can move into any of these advanced tools or solutions. I'm not going to ask you for all of your trade secrets today, but we're definitely going to pick your brain to see what some of your favorite automations are. Absolutely. So automations, they can be anything. And I'll expand on what I just started to say, which is automation is... Technology agnostic in my definition and the process science definition. So automation is nothing more than making sure that business decisions or decisions of any kind that are made by human today can be made by a lower cost resource tomorrow. So you could automate by saying you're the CEO right now and only you can make these decisions if you write down the logic you use so that a junior associate or even an intern could make those decisions. That's automation. That means you've reduced the cost of making decisions in your business. So the cheapest option for making decisions is an artificial intelligence or a robot or a software. But when you're talking about my favorite automations, automations that are well executed and save the business a lot of money, automations that impact decisions that are made like in high volume and high frequency, those are my favorite because they save you the most money because it, it's kind of a broad thing. But if you're looking for what are my favorite, maybe software solutions or things like that, I'm happy to give more detail. Yeah, definitely. But before we get to that, I just want to be clear because you basically help companies with process mapping. Yeah, absolutely. So process mapping always says that you talk about trade secrets. Process mapping is the first step. So no matter what kind of process work you're doing, if you want to do process science, you have to have process data. And process data comes in the form of process mapping. So no matter what I'm trying to do for a company, I always help them with process mapping first in one way or another. So let's pretend that I discovered your awesome company on the internet or through a referral and I have a new business. I've hired all these employees, but I do not have a management background and I want to automate. How do you start to work with me and just get the information together to get me going? Sure. You mentioned it. It's process mapping is the first step. So if you have no management experience, if you have no automation experience, in fact, if you're pretty new to business in general, the first thing that's going to serve you is being able to articulate your process. And process mapping is a great way to do it. And you don't need some fancy platform or fancy software tool to get started with process mapping. You can use pen and paper. 
a lot of people are intimidated by this idea, oh, I have to map my processes out as if it's some engineering level skill set or technical thing, but it's more just reflection and communication. If you're the entrepreneur or you're the idea person or you're the new manager or whatever, you have an idea of the process in your head, but before you can really understand and master what your process is, you have to be able to write it down in some way. And from there, you can contemplate automation, advanced forms of management, process improvement, but not until you write it down. So definitely start with that. And there's lots of, there's anything from just your first instinct of writing it down all the way through buying software tools to help you process map or hiring consultants to help you. Yeah, one thing that I find is that I have run across a lot of entrepreneurs who are very creative, but they may not have the business skills to actually run the business, but they're able to perform the work that gives them a certain lifestyle. So if you had to name some valuable skills that a business leader might need to have in order for process mapping to work, those skills. Yeah, it's a great question. I think that especially our more left-brained and creative folks, the idea of writing down and structuring process data sounds horrifying, right? It sounds like something you want to run away from. But I'll be honest, there's not a there's not a major skill set you need to learn. I think it's in the act of writing it down that makes something real. It makes something you can interrogate and it also makes something that you can apply your common sense to. So I'm really, I'm not trying to make it sound easier than it is because it's a discipline that you can build a lot of skill around. But to get started is draw a process map like you draw a piece of art. It's really just the fact that you can pull it out of your head and look at it that allows you to apply common sense to it, to really sense check whether what you're thinking in your own mind makes sense on paper. And I think creatives, analytical, math-oriented thinkers, they can all share the idea that a picture is worth a thousand words, that you have to be able to start in the fast pace that we move in business today, you have to start being able to draw out your business ideas. You have to be able to put it on paper to communicate it. And I think you don't need a lot of skills to do that, at least the first time, and just see where it goes. In that scenario, I may be a new business owner, but at some point I may be looking to scale. What would you say are the significant differences between scaling, automation, and growth? Yeah. So I'll give the formal definitions first because I do think this is really important to reinforce. Growth is sustainable net new revenue coming into the business. So I'll start there because you can say, hey, I do a flash sale or I give a bunch of discount coupons and a ton of people start buying stuff and you get a bunch of new revenue. That's not growth if the next month that revenue disappears because the promotion is over. Growth is just any way you can achieve sustainable net new revenue over time for your business. Scaling has to do with capability. So right now, if I have two people and I can do 15 service transactions, tomorrow I might need four people so I can do 30 service transactions. But you can keep your process the same. It's really just increasing capability. So when you talk about scaling, we're talking about how can I have more throughput through my business? But I will say when you go from two people to four people, it adds complexity and there's all this other stuff that happens. So scaling comes with, it's not just, hey, it's just a linear equation of scaling capability. So you have to also consider there's economies of scale, there's complexities with scale. There's a lot more art and nuance to scaling than just how I'm describing it. But that's the general idea of what scaling is. And then automation is actually the thing that ties them together. So if you wanna grow, you've got to be able to scale. And if you want to scale properly and sustainably, you have to be able to automate. Automation is reducing the cost of decision-making over time so that your business can grow. Because what happens is when you scale and you hire your first person, you realize, oh, training a person to do what I do as effectively as I do it is actually way harder than I might've thought. So the way you do that properly is through automation, automating decision-making down to lower cost resources. So they're all working together. I have to automate in order to scale appropriately, and I have to scale appropriately in order to grow sustainably. So hopefully that wasn't too academic, but that's how those things usually tie together. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Now, you have a concept called, and it's not, I know it's not your concept, but energy flow. How does energy flow relate to process work and building a better business? Yeah, absolutely. It sounds like this new age discipline, but it's really just talking about energy in the business sense is human labor and capital. So we'll start there. How do you get those forms of energy? Because think about energy as fuel to make things move. How do you get energy to flow faster through your company processes? That's really what we study as process scientists. We're studying how to increase flow. Because if you think about a business that makes 10 units a day, how do you make it make 20 units a day? 
What you're actually asking is, how do I put more energy into the front end of my business processes through capital, human labor, let's and create more faster and for more profitability. It's the same thing that if I had a bunch of pipes and they were getting dirty and I was pouring water on the top of them, the flow is going to be blocked. So I'm only getting a little bit of water out the bottom if they're filthy. There's a lot of different things you could do. You could change your piping system. You can unblock the pipes, but whatever you're trying to do, you're trying to increase flow. So when we're looking at business systems, we're doing the same thing. We're trying to say, what is your current flow through the business? What is the conversion of that flow into value creation? And how do we increase flow? So I'm really using those terms to in some ways be evocative, but also to let people know there's nothing more as a business manager or an entrepreneur than you have to worry about is energy flowing through your business. How fast and how effectively is energy flowing through my business is the, the master level principle, in my opinion. So here's the question, the million dollar question. How does one become a process scientist? Is that something that you go to school, you get a degree? Because I'm looking at just your background and it's so impressive. I'm going to let you tell our listeners about it. Sure. How did you become a process scientist? Yeah. So the honest answer is you just get to a point where you're as confident as I became at one point and start calling yourself a process scientist. That's a joking answer, but it's not really a well-defined discipline. It, and like you said, there's not a school or career track. Process improvement is becoming a really hot topic today. And the reason is since COVID, for instance, we saw this massive digitization of work processes. People are at home, they're geographically dispersed across the world. So there's this pressure now for people, the word process in the last 10 years, if you haven't heard it yet, it's becoming more of a thing, right? Because what is your process? How do we improve your digital processes? What's going on? And people are looking and they're scrambling to say, well, how do I find process people? What is the job title I hire? How do you become a process scientist? That's why, you know, I'm going long on the answer, but you're asking these questions. It's a very new discipline. And I want everyone to know that because if you're looking for it, you may seem confused. Process science is in its infancy. Process science is the study of change. It's the study of process systems, regardless of in what context. And I had to study science. I had to study traditional process improvement. I had to study business, project management, change management. All these things are integrated into this discipline of process science. But the one thing I would say is process is, if you're looking out there, everything processed before this point came from manufacturing. We're in a new digital age where digital services related process improvement is brand new. So if you're interested in it, you're at the, the edge of this exciting new discipline. If someone were interested in working with you, how would they contact you to work with you? And what does that look like? Sure. So there's a few different ways to contact and work with me. So I am doing some consulting work through my consulting brand. And we have a software company now, which is where I'm putting most of my energy. And that's what you introduced at the top of the episode, Truval. And we're making software products so that people can become their own process scientists. And that's what I'm most excited about. But reaching me either for coaching or consulting or just talking about the software product, the best way to get me is sam at truval.com. You can also just go to truval.com and sign up. You can also find me on LinkedIn. I'm the only Sam Drawshack online. So if you just look up my name from this episode, you can find me. I'm pretty accessible from any direction. Now, what I love as well is that you have free resources. You actually have a video podcast on YouTube. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So the business therapy podcast is really me and my co-founder creating a forum where we could talk to businesses. We went through several iterations of the show. Sometimes we did business therapy where actual entrepreneurs came on with live problems that we helped them talk through. We also just did topic chats about various process science topics or topics on the edge of artificial intelligence automation just to stimulate different levels of thinking. But we were really just trying to create a place where we could have common sense conversations about many of the struggles that business entrepreneurs, but also just people in corporate roles were struggling with about scaling, automation, growth, about employee morale, productivity. There's so many things happening so fast today. That's really what the podcast is about, just trying to find topics that would resonate with people who are Tired of reading the same things online and being told the same things, especially as business is changing so rapidly now. Nothing today was the same 10 years ago or even 20 years ago. And I think people lose track of how thing, how fast things are changing. So it's overwhelming for people just talking about these kind of things. And just backing up to our conversation on AI, a lot of people are afraid that AI is going to replace people. How do you see the landscape changing with this being just another tool in the next five years? Yeah, you basically summarized my thoughts on it. I think there's no question that AI 
can replace some forms of labor. But that's been the same issue since the Industrial Revolution. People were complaining when the first automatic loom was created that, oh, now textile jobs are going to be lost. It's true. Anytime you create a new, more advanced tool, a new advanced form of automation, people are going to look how they can automate by moving people's jobs to that tool to lower their costs and to create more efficiency. So there's no question that there is going to be some job loss and some function loss to new technology and new artificial intelligence. Now, is it, do we need to be any more afraid of it than we have for the last several hundred years in various times? I think that's debatable. My professional opinion is that many companies are years away from even applying and integrating these advanced tools in the most basic sense. There's still a lot of companies that are struggling to implement tools that were created 10 years ago, just regular software tools. So I guess my summary answer to the point is I don't see any massive disruption coming from this wave of AI more so than I did from any of the other software robotics, robotic process automation, SaaS revolution. We've had a lot of technology explosions in the last 10 or 15 years, and I don't see any reason why this one is going to be massively more disruptive than any of those. Okay, so now it's time for you to give us some of your favorite software automations. We try to give our listeners tools that they can use, just actionable pieces of information that they can implement in their business now. Do you have any favorites? Yeah, for sure. And some of them are enterprise, and but so I'm going to stick more to like small, medium businesses. I think CRM, customer relationship management systems, are really big right now and everyone has their eyes on them. And I will recommend HubSpot is one that I've been implementing a lot lately with smaller clients. And I do think it can really benefit every business to have a stronger customer relationship management platform, no matter what kind of business you're in. And HubSpot is one of the best. It's accessible. It's pricing scales well with young businesses. And I think getting used to managing your marketable contacts and your lead generation and your sales flow in a system like a structured place instead of Excel or like a traditional Rolodex, I think it will really give you an edge as a young business. And beyond HubSpot, I do think it depends on what kind of company you're in. But I do think if you're in more of an operating business, if you're handling customer cases or customer reports, I think Zendesk, I think ServiceNow, some of those ticket or case management systems are really strong also to put into that middle section of your business. And then if you're more in the project space, if you're digital marketing, if you're helping with the SOAP projects for clients, I think having a project management system like a Monday.com or a Hive or even making sure that you have a Slack in place for communications. These are some of the common names in the business, but these are all automation tools. These are all helping us do things that we used to do over email and chat in a more structured way. So I threw out a few names there. I could probably go on, but I'll pause there. I think those are some of the tools that I'm seeing a lot of lift with uh, for small businesses if you haven't tuned into those already. One last question for you. If you had one single piece of advice that you can share with a business owner that would help them play big faster, what would that be? Yeah. The biggest thing is watching your energy flow. And we talked about it briefly, but if your energy ever feels blocked, then you're probably doing the wrong thing. And how does it feel when your own personal energy feels blocked? Because if your energy is blocked, then your business energy is also probably blocked. It feels like you're getting a lot of resistance from the activities you're doing. It feels like you are working 80 hours a week and you're burning out. It feels like everything is harder than it should be and nothing's working. These are not signs that you should be working harder. These are signs that your energy flow is blocked and it's through looking at the process you're doing and trying to reorganize it so that it better matches your preferences. It better matches what gives you energy. It better matches your spirit and your sort of philosophical alignment. That's how you find success in entrepreneurship, not by working harder and overcoming obstacles, but by being self-aware that obstacles can be overcome by conscious means. And that might be a little harder, easier said than done, but that's my biggest, it should always be fun. Everyone says it should always be a lot of work. It should always be fun. And if it's not fun, it's not going to be sustainable. And if it's not sustainable, then your business doesn't have a great prognosis for sustainable health. So that's my biggest tip for entrepreneurs. Well, Samuel, thank you so much for joining us today. And until next time, play big faster. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Play Big Faster podcast. Want more entrepreneurial content? I like this. Make sure to subscribe for future episodes. I already subscribed. I just clicked on it. Don't forget to like and leave a review. Share with a friend that needs this in their life. I think you need this more than I. Oh, and make sure to follow Cherie on IG at Cherie Speaks. And remember to play big faster.